Our scripture this morning comes from Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I want to read that and give you just a little bit uh, of a reminder of where we're at in this uh, great book of Nehemiah. What is, what's occurred to this point? Do you have it today? Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 from the New International Version. When Sanballat heard that we were re rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they are building, even a fox climbing upon it, would break down their walls of stone. And then there's a change of pace. And he begins to pray, Nehemiah does. And he says, Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their New King James Version says, for the people had a mind to work. Wow. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. And Father, thank you for tilling the soil of our heart and our mind. Lord, we're, we're receiving this word today knowing that we'll never be the same. For your word accomplishes the purpose that you sent it to do. Yes. God, may we become not only hearers of your word, but doers of your word. Yes. And we give you praise for it in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen, amen and amen. All right. Last week as we looked at this story, Nehemiah had communicated the vision to the people of rebuilding the walls and, and, and the gates. And, and, and he explained how God was with him and with them. Uh, aren't you glad to know that God's with us? Amen? Uh, he explained how God had already been orchestrating uh, everything so that the vision might come to fruition. Uh, and, and how God was putting talent and resources and, and people into place to accomplish the vision. And the people understood that God was in it. And their answer was, yes, let's do it. Yes, let's rebuild the wall. And so they were excited. How many know that at the beginning, you're always excited to do what God wants you to do? Amen? Uh, there's some momentum. There's some things going on. You've heard how God is uh, going to be involved in it. And, and so... Nehemiah grabs that momentum and he begins to strategically assign people uh, sections of the wall in front of their own house. It's important that you hear that, understand it. So that they would have incentive to work. Can you say the word incentive? Incentive. Now, we're, we're going to come back to that, but I, I want you to put that in your memory bank. The word incentive. You see... And as we see from the text today, that just because God lays a vision on your heart, it doesn't mean that uh, there won't be an enemy that, that will come and try to stop it. Amen? You, you see, with every God-ordained vision, there will be an enemy that wants to stop it. Uh, with, with everything that God lays on your heart, there will be uh, 
foes and enemy and the uh, devil will come against that coming to fruition. Can, can I get an amen? Uh, can I get an I've been there before. I understand that. Uh, let me uh, give you a witness of that. You know what I'm saying? With every God-ordained vision, there is always an enemy that wants to stop it. Uh, and it's important for us to understand that. Because if you think that you're going to uh, start doing something for the Lord and it's all going to go good and gravy, then you're going to get disappointed and be tempted to quit. But you can't quit. you got to keep going on. I'm already preaching if you haven't uh, noticed that. But you got to understand that there is an enemy that wants to come against you and does not want you to succeed. The people began rebuilding the wall. And they were making great progress. But not everybody was happy. Sanballat. And I'm not sure how you say that. I want to say Sanballat or Sanballay or something like that. Sanballat. Sanballat. Oh, good. <laughs> All right. Anyway, he was angry. Why was he angry? You'd think that it would be a good thing for the walls to be rebuilt, and for the, everything to, 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 to be nice uh, around uh, Sanballat, and, and he would have uh, liked that. But he was a man who was a governor. Yeah. He had position, and he had power. Uh, he was governor of uh, Samaria, and so when the Jews began to rebuild, he said, ah, I don't like that. I want everything to stay like it is. I want the status quo. Uh, because when the status quo was there, he had all the position and all the power that he needed. Can I tell you that the enemy wants to tell you that it's all right like it is. The enemy wants you uh, to think that the status quo is okay. But can I tell you for a Christian, there is never status quo. Uh, you're either falling back or you're going forward. Uh, there, there has to be momentum going forward. And there is going to be some opposition. Look at your neighbor and say, there's, there's going to be opposition. Uh, and we, we've got to understand that. Uh, we, we, we've got to know, and as we look at this, he began to ridicule and to make fun of the Israelites. How many of you remember as kids maybe being made fun of? <coughs> and they all must have been perfect. But I don't know. <laughs> you see, for those who don't know it, I was born clubfoot. I wore hats, braces, and all that kind of thing. And when I, I remember specifically being in the fifth grade, and we were doing the president's uh, challenge. Who can jump the farthest? Who can run uh, the fastest? Who can uh, do the most pull-ups? Who can do all of these things? And I remember we had a foot race. And, and, and this time it was different. We weren't all lined up. You just kind of go against one other person. And I remember a kid saying, he runs funny. And I tell you that stuck with me. It hurt. It hurt. But there was also something inside of me. You see, you can go two ways. You, when you face opposition, when you face ridicule, you can take a step back and you can say, I'm never going to do that again. Yeah. And you can pull a poor little me. Yeah. But I wasn't having any of that. And so, I still walk a little funny. I still run out. But I began to apply myself physically. And I excelled in jumping. I, I, I couldn't run fast, but I could jump fast. <coughs> Ain't that right, little brother? Pretty close. Pretty close. <laughs> I actually set a school record. Jump six foot six. And I don't mean out that way, I mean out this way. Little brother broke the record. 
<laughs> and I tell you, I was very thrilled that he did, actually. Uh, but, but I want you to understand that there's two ways to face opposition. Do you, do you, are you where I'm at? Do you understand? Uh, and the people didn't pay any attention to the ridicule. They, they, they kept on going. Nehemiah, watch what Nehemiah did. Can, can I tell you that you cannot argue with the enemy? That's right. It's not healthy for you to argue with the enemy. Uh, and so he did not argue with Sanballat. He, he didn't do that. Instead, he prayed. He prayed. And, 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 and I don't know if the people heard him. I, I, may, I, I believe they did because it says after that that the people went back to work. Yes. You see, if you want to get back at the enemy, and you know who your enemy is, keep on keeping on. Yes, that's right. Keep on going. Keep on uh, believing. And, and so you, you see that uh, the people stayed focused. They, they didn't get distracted. Uh, they went to God in prayer and they began to return to building. How much better off would we be if our first response to criticism was not to argue, but to go to God in prayer and say, God, I can't stand. I can't handle this. I can't do it on my own. I need you to be my defense. So, don't try to argue with the devil. Give it back to God and say, God, you take care of it. Okay. And the devil's going to try to discourage you and he's going to try to distract you. He really is. Um, look at verse 2 and verse 3. And Jason, I want you to just keep it up there. Verse 2. And it says, And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said... What are those feeble Jews doing? The devil wants you to think that you are a nobody. Yeah, right. Did you notice? What are those? He didn't just say, what are those Jews doing? What are the people of God doing? He said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Yeah, right. you, you see, the enemy wants you to think that you are nothing. That you're weak, that you're puny, that you're feeble, that you're not going to be able to accomplish what God has laid in your heart. That's right. Now look at the, the next thing. He, he says, will they restore their wall? Hmm. What's the enemy saying there? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? I believe the enemy is trying to say, get you to question if God's really in it. Yes. <coughs> First, and, and if he can't get you to think that I'm a nobody, then he's going to get you to question whether or not God's really in this thing. Are they going to be able to uh, offer sacrifices? Are they going to build the temple back up? Are they going to be able to return back to the way of living that God wants them to live? And He wants you and I to question the, the very vision that God has laid in our heart. Is God in this thing? Have you been there? Yeah. Will they restore the walk? And he wants you to, come to question whether or not it's possible for the vision to be completed. Can, can I tell you the devil doesn't care if you start a vision as much as he cares if you complete the vision. You, you, you know where I'm at, right? Uh, will they finish it in a day? Can I tell you he wants you to question the resources? That you have. Huh. Can they bring the stones back to life? This is verse 3. Can they bring the stones back to life from the heaps 
of rubble burned as they are. You see, so if, if the enemy can't get you to doubt yourself and doubt whether God is in it, then what he begins to say, well, God might be in it, you might be able to do it, but there's no provision. There, there's no, a so, the, your source is, is too small. It's burned up. It's in a heap. It's a rubble. And so, he won't, can I tell you, that we serve Jehovah yes. Jireh. Yes. Yes. The Lord my provider. Yes. Oh, I'm glad you know that. I hear you some of you. And, and we need not question if God will supply. Amen? And, and as you look at this, I think the final thing he wants us to question is whether the vision is worth the risk and the sacrifice. Is it worth the risk and the sacrifice? Even a fox climbing upon it would break down their wall, is what Tobiah said. So, here the enemy is trying to get them to say, well, even if we get this done, it's not going to be like before. It's going to be weak. It's going to not, not really provide the protection. It's not going to be... Can, can I tell you that the enemy wants you to concentrate on what it used to be like? Yes, yes, yes. Amen? Uh, how God used to move. Uh, how, how He used to do things. But, but God wants you to center on Him. Now, go back to verse 2, Jason, real quick. Bethany. I want to show you one more thing. Here, and this jumped out at me this morning. Actually, as we were sitting in Sunday school class, and I was reading back through this, and it says this. What are those? Say the word those. those. Feeble Jews do it. Will they, say they, they. restore their wall? <coughs> Will they Offer sacrifices. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life? That's right. It's not about you and I. Do we have the power or the provision? Uh, can we make it happen? I want you to understand that it's not because of you, but it's because of God that the vision will come to pass, that you will make it, that you will be able to finish it, and I want you to see that here. When we put it in God's hands, the problem is we, we try to put it back in our hand and figure it all out. Huh. All right, let's move on. That's good stuff. Can I tell you that there's always going to be sacrifice and risk in following the vision that God lays on your life? Uh, it, it is. In order to carry it out, it's necessary for us to sometimes leave the comfortable and, and the familiar and to embrace the uncomfortable and the unfamiliar. What am I saying? Visions rarely come to pass unless somebody is willing to take a leap of faith. Uh, to, to wholeheartedly uh, uh, jump in. Following the vision always requires a wholehearted commitment. Can I tell you, you can't halfway do it. You've got to uh, jump in with both feet. You've got, you got to follow after. Can I tell you that launching a vision is like parachuting? You don't halfway parachute. You're either in the plane or you're in the air. Amen? Uh, and so you know I would be in the plane. Uh, let me tell you, I'm not jumping out of a, a perfectly good plane, but, but you understand what I'm saying. Launching a vision, you don't do it halfway. You don't say, well, I may or well, I might. You jump in with both feet. Can I tell you that? Now think about it. Uh, it was because of David 
who was facing the giant. No one else was willing to jump in with both feet. No one else was willing to take the risk. No one else. But it was because David said, uh, who is that uh, Philistine uh, that he would talk about God and the army of God and, he, and, and, and uh, uh, an anger, a holy anger began to rise up with him. And he said, I'm going to take the leap of faith. I'm going to step out. I'm going to do that. You can't halfway do a vision right. that God's laid on your heart. Now, think about Peter. We all love Peter. I mean, we talk about how bold and brash he is, and he always sticks his foot in his mouth. And... But can I tell you that Peter would have never walked on the water? If he had not first been willing to get out of the boat. Right. And, and he couldn't just halfway hold on to the boat. <laughs> <laughs> he had to swing both legs over, put his feet into the water, and begin to walk. Yes. Launching a vision requires a whole hearted <coughs> commitment. The enemy wants you to get distracted. Um, he wants you to take your energy and to focus it on all kinds of things. Am I right? Yes. Uh, isn't this life distracting? Yes. It requires a wholehearted commitment to follow the vision that God uh, has laid on your heart. Can I tell you, in order for us to experience the fulfillment of the vision that God has laid on our heart, that we have to be willing to take the risk and make the sacrifice that's necessary. We have to wholeheartedly commit. We, we have to do that. Uh, can I tell you that as you look at the, the Israelites here, the Jews, we look at it and we think, well, he just got them all together and they began to build it. No big deal. Their economy was agriculturally driven. You may have worked on a farm, raised a garden. It's hard work. It's tiring. It takes a long time. But yet, they began to focus on something that was more important. Honoring God. The people not being uh, a disgrace to God. And, and when they... Can I tell you, when they weren't planting, they weren't going to eat. There was no Piggly Wiggly. There was no a &P. No Super Kroger bigger than any in the state. When they weren't working, they weren't eating. Understand the sacrifice. The wholehearted commitment that they had to see the vision Completed. You see, adding this project to their daily routine meant putting other things on hold. Sometimes, if we're to fulfill the vision that God's laid in our heart, we need to put other things on hold. I didn't say that they were bad things. Sometimes, we have to sacrifice the good in order for the better. Yes. Yes. Sometimes we have to do that. It, it requires, look at your neighbor and say, it's a wholehearted commitment. The reason that many Christians and many churches don't see God's vision accomplished is because they're not willing to make the sacrifice. They're not willing to take the risk. They're not willing to wholly commit to what God has given them. But can I tell you that I believe Crosspoint Church is a different kind of church? Maybe you don't. Do you believe that Crosspoint Church is a different kind of church? Yes. Yes. Where the leaders and the members do whatever it takes to reach their community for Jesus Christ. I believe that we're a people who are willing to uh, sacrifice our preferences, our wants, even though it might not be comfortable or convenient. In order to 
complete the vision. You, you see, completing the vision, it, it was never, they were never told that this was going to be an easy thing. But yet they stayed focused. They sacrificed the good for the better. And they kept on working. And they kept on going. And they kept on believing that not them, but God would supply. Yes. Right? So Nehemiah's first response, we looked at it, it was prayer. Despite the criticism, they continued to work. But the enemy heard that they were still making progress. And he became even angrier. Now, can, can I tell you, I want to tell you something about your enemy. Your enemy, first of all, is going to play the mind game with you. He's going to criticize you. He's going to make fun of you. He's going to uh, get you to doubt. How many knows that the, the enemy always comes in uh, to the mind and, he, and he's trying to get you to doubt? That's the first way that the enemy attacks. But what I want you to understand is that your enemy doesn't play fair and he will attack you physically if you don't give up in your mental aspect of it. I, I know you don't want to shout about that, but I want you to understand that, that you've got to understand that. Enemy's not uh, above that. So the enemy said here in this situation that we're going to come in and attack the people, and we're going to create confusion. Now think about that. Vision, to accomplish it, requires focus. The opposite of focus is confusion. So the enemy wants to come in and attack. Uh, the, the, the wall wasn't fully built yet. And, and, and we see the enemy wants to come in. And can I tell you, they were just people. And if you heard that your homeland was going to be attacked, your first response would probably be fear and distraction. And the people were fearful. The people were distracted. The people were almost, I'm going to say almost, Almost ready to give up. Hmm. They were starting to lose their momentum. They were starting to lose their vision. They were starting to lose their hope. And Nehemiah knew he couldn't ignore the problem. Great leaders don't uh, ignore problems. They come up with solutions. Can I get an amen? Uh, and so Nehemiah knew he, he had to have a, a plan. Somebody say a plan. Uh, and so Nehemiah begins to change the plan. Can I tell you that your plan might change, but the vision doesn't change. Uh, the, the ultimate end to the vision uh, is, the, is not going to uh, be hindered. The vision is the vision. Look at me and say that. The vision is the vision. <laughs> your plan might change. Can I tell you there's nothing wrong with how you get to the end result? The vision uh, won't change, but the plan might. Because when the enemy steps in and tries to attack, Nehemiah would have been foolish to just say, well, do two things. Well, either we're, we're going to give up, or we're not going to even be concerned that the enemy's going to attack. That would have been foolish on both parts, right? So, what does he do? Look at verses 13 and 14 with me. Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families. <coughs> Say by families. by families. It's important, keep it in your mind. With their swords, with their spears and bows. <coughs> And after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid. Yes. Wow. Look at, your, look at your neighbor right now and say, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. The enemy might be ready to attack, but don't be afraid. And I, don't be afraid of them, 
And it goes on to say, remember the Lord. Remember the great and awesome God that you serve. Remember Him when the enemy steps in. Uh, when the enemy comes in like a flood, uh, the, the God's Spirit will raise up a standard against them, the Bible tells us. And remember that we serve an awesome and mighty and great God who knows what the enemy is trying to do to you. He's trying to distract you. He's trying to get you disturbed. He's trying to get you to concentrate on you. Remember, look at your name and say, remember the Lord. Remember, remember the Lord. Who is great and awesome. And fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your homes. Tracy, if you begin to make your way to the piano. So Nehemiah in, implements a new plan to get to this vision. He begins to place people at the lowest parts of the walls with their swords and their spears in their hand. And then he exhorted them, do not be afraid. Hallelujah. See, the enemy wants to paralyze you yes. with fear. Yes. How many of you ever really got scared? What happens is you... <laughs> he wants to paralyze you with fear so that you can't accomplish the vision. But how do you combat the fear? You remember the source of your vision. Uh, you remember how great and how awesome God is. I'm preaching right now. Uh, and so, he, can I tell you, uh, you might look at it as a lack of faith, but, but posting a guard was not a lack of faith. Posting a guard was an understanding that they had an enemy and they must post a guard. I want to tell you, post a guard. Don't give up on the vision. Remember the Lord. I believe that He is going to help you to accomplish the vision. Somebody give the Lord a hand. Place. Nehemiah places the families in strategic places along the wall with their weapons in their hands. Why? Because it would give them incentive to fight if necessary. Who are they standing there with? Their families. Can I tell you the enemy wants us to be distracted from the vision that God has laid for a church. Over the past few weeks, I've got an opportunity to give you a glimpse of what I believe God wants us to do as a church. Hallelujah. Can I tell you uh, that only 15% of Woodford Countyans going to church on a Sunday is a problem. Let's not lose sight of why we do what we do. Keep going. Now, why is that important? Because the very people that we need to reach, think about it. Here are the people with their swords and their spears. They're standing behind the low parts of the wall with their families. Somebody say, with their families. The very people that we are called to reach first are our families. That ought to be incentive. That's the word I wanted you to hear at this time. There ought to be incentive enough for us to reach our families in this community. The very people whose hearts and lives and destinies need to be changed are our families. I don't know about you, but when the enemy begins to attack my family, uh, uh, he, he might discourage me a little bit, but what he doesn't understand is that just gives me more and more incentive to, to follow after the vision that God has called me. Some of you have given up on your family. Help us. Some of you have said it's too hard. Just, they'll never be reached for God. Some of us have said that. Some of us have done that. But we have incentive, folks. It's our family. It's my family. It's your family. And we need to rise up and fight against the enemy. And 
accomplish the vision that God has called us to. Can, can I tell you, they didn't even have to fight. Because when the enemy found out that God had revealed the plan to them, they got discouraged. You see, what happens is what the enemy would bring to our harm, God turns it around and he brings it to our good. Now that ought to make you shout because if you're facing a mountain, I want you to understand that God is making a way. God's going to turn that mountain into a blessing. God's going to help you get through it. God's going to help you accomplish the purpose that he's made you to do. Somebody stand up. Just stand up.